Thank you to Sages and the panel for the uh, invitation. Uh, I have some disclosures. This uh, has no relevance to the talk. So this is the outline of my talk. Essentially, we're going to talk about why do we need uh, the Tokyo guidelines? Why do we even need to define uh, cholecystitis? That being said, what, what the diagnostic criteria in the Tokyo guidelines have been and their evolution over the past 10 years. How do you determine severity grading in the Tokyo guidelines? And finally, what kind of diagnostic tests are available and which ones are the recommended ones to use? So why do we even need the Tokyo guidelines? So it sometimes seems that things we face are so obvious and so commonplace that we don't really need to define them, but if you actually ask a bunch of surgeons what cholecystitis actually, how to make the diagnosis, you, you'll get three different answers. So this was recognized in Japan, and in 2006, an international consensus meeting was convened in Tokyo, and the goals of that meeting were to develop uniform criteria for diagnostic uh, uh, criteria for acute cholecystitis and severity. And this was because there were really better comparisons that were needed between treatments across institutions. When you're doing multi-center trials or comparing data from different uh, trials and countries, there's really no way to know for sure whether the same patient population was being examined. As can be uh, seen, there were wide ranges in mortality for acute cholecystitis, anywhere from 0.3% to 6%. So th that tells you that there's some problem with defining how sick these patients are in a concise way. So what the Tokyo Guidelines consensus meeting uh, involved was prior to that a systemic, systematic literature review uh, supplemented by expert opinion. As you can imagine, there were not always great uh, level one evidence for these uh, guidelines. And then there was a formal consensus conference with surgeons, members of the public, and voting and ultimately that's how the Tokyo guidelines were formed. So these are the original criteria proposed at the meeting in 2007. As you can see, we have um, clinical signs and as well as imaging findings. And as the discussion at the meeting progressed, these became more organized in terms of local signs of inflammation, systemic signs, and imaging findings characteristic of acute cholecystitis. So initially there was a proposal for suspected diagnosis, which would mean an item in one plus two, um, and then a definite diagnosis, which also um, would involve item three in patients with suspected cholecystitis. So ultimately this was what was decided upon. They eliminated the suspected diagnosis and ended up with a definite diagnosis. So the other caveat to this uh, criteria are that you need to exclude other diseases that can mimic acute cholecystitis, so acute hepatitis, other acute abdominal emergencies, and chronic cholecystitis doesn't apply to this criteria. So in 2013, another consensus conference was reconvened. This is just in recognition that there's going to be new literature, there's going to be new opinion that, that evolves over time. and so. These guidelines are not intended to be permanent. They're intended to evolve. So at this meeting, essentially the two criticisms that were brought up were that with the original criteria of two definite diagnoses, this really led to a lot of ambiguity in clinical practice. It, it seemed odd that you could have two definite yet different diagnoses. The other thing that was brought up was that there was no mechanism for suspected diagnoses that would allow you then to proceed from a suspected to a confirmed diagnosis. And how do they perform? So if you actually look at these criteria versus the Murphy sign, there was higher sensitivity but less specificity for Tokyo guidelines. So overall, a little better in diagnostic accuracy but not great. So at least, you know, we are progressing as far as our um, accuracy compared to traditional criteria. So these were the final criteria. So they, as you can see, they reinstated the suspected diagnosis and then confirmed diagnosis just became one, um, one set. 
There has also been validation studies, so a multicenter study involving about 500 patients from multiple sites looking at the sensitivity and specificity of these guidelines with the revised criteria. It was actually very good, so above 90% for both sensitivity and specificity. So 2018 rolls around, and we have another chance to review the guidelines. So in this uh, most recent iteration, literature was reviewed. There was really no uh, further literature that required changes in the criteria for diagnosis, so essentially they stayed the same. So on to severity grading. So severity grading is really important because as we know, there's a whole spectrum of, of patients with cholecystitis. There's some from very mild disease all the way to very uh, critically ill patients, and so this was largely the criteria that was proposed in 2007. They have not really changed significantly. The criteria for severe acute cholecystitis involves organ dysfunction. So as you can see there, there's different organ systems that will become uh, compromised in these patients. Moderate uh, cholecystitis really refers to conceptually those cases in which there's going to be a degree of inflammation that's gonna be high and it's gonna make cholecystectomy more difficult. So things like a, a highly elevated white count, a palpable mass in the right upper quadrant, and a long duration of the uh, illness, as well as clinical and um, radiographic signs such as gangrenous or emphyseminous cholecystitis. These are predictably gonna be much harder cases. And mild cases do not meet any of the above criteria. So to make this easy for folks, uh, many of you may be aware that there is an app that you can download that will allow you to really have a thorough uh, understanding, uh, read some of the background articles on, on this criteria, and you can use the app to uh, look at acute cholecystitis and acute cholangitis as well. You can use um, things like a calculator for diagnostic criteria where you very easily can input the signs um, and data from your patient, and you end up getting either a suspected or definite diagnosis. There's also, um, as some of the speakers will, um, <clears throat> I'm sure, talk about uh, algorithms and uh, flow charts for management of this disease. So if we look at how these gr severity gradings actually perform, this is a study uh, in Japan and Taiwan, multicenter, almost 5,000 patients. If you look at mortality according to grade, there's a clear worsening mortality with severity. So grade three has about a 5.5% mortality. So the guidelines do make sense from a mortality prediction standpoint. If you have a look just at the grade three mortality patients, according to the number of <clears throat> organ systems involved, the higher number of organ systems, the higher the mortality. And you can see there's a group with up to even 25% mortality. <coughs> so in terms of other factors like how often these patients require conversion to open, this was a retrospective study in the U.S. and you can see it very nicely correlates with, with the grades of uh, severity. Length of stay also is predicted based on the severity. This is a study of population-based case control looking at bile duct injury. So major bile duct injury in 158 patients, they compared it to a matched group. And what they found were factors that increased the risk were acute cholecystitis, emergency cases, years with gallstone disease, more than five years, history of prior acute cholecystitis, and the high comorbidity index. But if you look at Tokyo criteria for grade, these were also predictive. So you can see that they also um, correlate with bile duct injury. What was protective, interestingly, in this study was intent to perform IOC. This was intent prior to the injury as opposed to IOC performed after an injury. So with imaging, there's all these modalities that, that have come about. How do we choose which is the best one. So if we look at ultrasound, these are the criteria that are typically um, diagnostic for acute cholecystitis and can help really determine that diagnosis. So wall th thickening, 
gallbladder diameter, which can be variable depending on the patient size, but typically uh, long axis diameter greater than eight centimeters or short axis greater than four is predictive of acute cholecystitis. If you see a stone impacted in the neck, as you see there, as well as debris in the gallbladder. This is another um, picture showing an intraluminal flap here, for example. This is suggestive of gangrenous cholecystitis. So this is how you can make the grade two uh, severity diagnosis. So overall, ultrasound has a, a modest sensitivity and specificity. The good things are that it's non-invasive. It's generally widely available and pretty cheap. So in terms of first choice imaging modalities, this remains the first choice. So MRI with and without contrast, is along with MRCP, these are some findings which uh, can predict acute cholecystitis. However, we all know that this modality is a lot more expensive than ultrasound or CT scan. There's some patient cooperation required. If the patient is in pain and they have to hold their breath for a long time for these scans, you're not going to get a very high quality scan. This is something to consider if you need to evaluate the rest of the biliary tree, but otherwise ultrasound is a much better first choice. CT scan is really the dominant alternative to ultrasound. This case shows a discontinuity in the wall indicating a gangrenous cholecystitis. And here you can see the other findings, so pericholcystic fluid, thickened wall, straining around the gallbladder and the fat. This is emphyseminous cholecystitis, so this is a diagnosis that is difficult sometimes to make with ultrasound or with MRI. MRI will not pick up the air very well. So CT is really the best test for this diagnosis. HIDA scan is also uh, sometimes utilized. Problem with this scan is that it's typically not available during after hours times. There are some findings such as non-visualization -visual of the gallbladder as well as what's called the rim sign, which you can see here. It's an augmentation of activity around the gallbladder. You can see, for example, here, a dark outline around the gallbladder. And this is not always very um, sensitive for cholecystitis, but if you see it, it can be a sign that there's cholecystitis. So the problem with this test, in addition to what was mentioned, was that if you have biliary obstruction or cholecystitis, you're not going to get excretion of that tracer, and you're not going to be able to do a very uh, good diagnostic test. So this is a simplified algorithm. So generally, ultrasound is going to be your first line uh, imaging. If you got indeterminate findings, then I think a CT or a HIDA, probably in that order, are the best tests to get. CT certainly will be helpful if you have suspicion for a grade two cholecystitis. So take home points. Tokyo guidelines have really helped standardize the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. <clears throat> They're really pretty easily used, especially with the app. The grade can help predict mortality and complications, and as you will see in some of the speakers, they'll be used to try to predict which treatment is the best. Each of these imaging modalities have their strengths and weaknesses. They have a role. You, you should know the pros and cons of each. In general, ultrasound is going to be your first best line, uh, best first line test, followed by CT and or HIDA if you still need to confirm the diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you.